Hello, welcome back to our journey through the FSL pipeline. I realize this might be a little slow, but it's a very complete um, journey. I'm explaining each step of the way. So today we're going to talk about setting things up in the feet GUI. And there will be a few things that I select or don't select here that I will would like to explain further, and I will. So where we are in the workflow, we're actually doing pretty well. We're down, whoops, we're down here running the level ones. So this would be the uh, within run analysis. Level twos would be, in this case, within subject because I'm assuming each subject has multiple runs. It does for the data set I'm using and that I think a lot of you might be using. But um, yeah, if you only have one run per subject, then you can just hang on, watch the, these level two videos and then jump back into analyzing your data for the group level analysis. So that's where we are. And this step, this full step will take longer than one video. So today I'm going to go through the basic setup of the GUI. I had a very pleasant surprise when I went to do it um, just quickly to practice it before recording the video. I saw the FSL made a change I wasn't aware of. So no worries, I wrote a new script to fix the problem. Um, and then actually I prefer the change. We'll get there. I'll show you what it is in a second. Um, next, I'm going to have this uh, background video to explain some of the behind the scenes of these options that we're choosing because I want you to be educated button pushers. So for example, I personally and the labs that I have worked with in the past, the current lab I'm in is a bit of a mix. We don't use slice timing correction for task fMRI. So I want to explain why you can learn why you would or why you wouldn't and then you make your own decision. And last, uh, the GUI is great. Uh, some people, it's a lot easier to visualize what you're doing when you set it up in a GUI. And although you might prefer the GUI to scripting, I'm going to heavily, heavily, heavily persuade you, hopefully, to or, or encourage you to script it. And that will be the third video or the third section. The second video, I don't know how long this will be. This might actually be two separate videos, but scripting it is awesome because once you set up one in the GUI, it creates a file and then you just do a simple search and replace to create all the rest of your analyses. So, right, and nothing breaks my heart more than watching somebody uh, sit at the computer, click, click, clicking away at the GUI. That's not a way to spend your time. So, what do you need to do this? You need your bold data, and hopefully you've already trimmed off the bad volumes if you needed to and you've assessed the data to see uh, if your subject had too much motion to continue further in the analyses. You also need your onset timing files. So I don't have a video on this because it's so widely varied depending on if you use Python or MATLAB or uh, whatever you use to deliver your stimuli, your onset timing files will be in different formats and it'll be different for different studies. So that was up to you. I did go over the structure of these files um, most often they're three column format files. Field maps, if you're using them. Um, you know, most, I'd say nine times out of 10, I'm fine without it. All the field map correction does is it helps improve the image registration if you had signal dropout. Um, yeah, at least that's all I've ever used it for. And I'll explain more about that later. Slice timing information, if you care to do that, double check that. I know of a group that um, thought they knew the slice timing and it was actually the opposite of what they thought, so it had been done wrong for a while, but then they fixed it. And also your skull strip structurals, which came from a previous step. So you should have those. If you don't have the skull strip uh, structurals or if your bold data aren't ready, you know, click here to go see that video, click here to go see uh, that video and you can watch it process your data and you're all set. All right, so let's go. I am going to go, I use X quartz. I don't know if this is required. It's just how I, um, just what I've chosen to do. So I'm on a Mac. So I open feet by typing feet underscore GUI and I always put the ampersand so I don't lose my window. If you're in Linux, you'll just type feet in an ampersand, but again, I'm on a Mac, so feet underscore GUI for me. Linux users, just feet. Capital F, not lowercase f. That capital is important in Linux. And that will open the very state-of-the-art looking GUI. Uh, who cares what it looks like? It works. Okay, so you see we have multiple tabs here and we have a couple pull-downs here. 
So this first pull down is for if you're doing first level or higher level, we're doing first level, so we'll leave it there. And whether we're doing full analysis, just pre-processing, or just statistics, we're going to do the whole thing. So we're going to choose full analysis. You'll see if I do just pre-processing, it dimmed the stats and post stats tabs here. So I don't know. Always do full analysis. So let's start with the miscellaneous tab. Um, balloon help, that refers to when you hold the cursor over something, a little balloon pops up. Sometimes that gets annoying. Um, I like it because if I forget something, I can just hold the cursor there and then read the balloon. Progress Watcher. Uh, as feet runs, it generates an HTML output file. This thing is awesome. We're going to go over that during the QA step. But if you leave this checked on, it will launch HD, uh, whatever your browser is for you. And you might not want it to do that. So um, if you're submitting this to a grid or something like that, you're going to want to turn off the progress watcher. I'll leave it on just to show you what it does. All right, first tab is where you load in your data. This is when I had my my sad discovery. So I'm going to click select 4D data. This is course. This is referring to my bold data set. So I'm going to click that, and now I need to go and select it. So where am I? Seriously, where am I? Okay. So I'm going to go into I actually don't know where I am. Ah, okay, I'm in the onsets directory. Nowhere near where I want to be. So I am in the bold directory. This is subject one. So I'm going to go into task 001, run 001, and select the bold. Uh, just ignore this. Select this. And then hit OK. Uh-oh, this is when I had some sad times this morning. The input file has a TR of 1. If the data was generated, oh, that's annoying, data's plural. If the data were generated with an older MRI sequence, this may be incorrect. So it turns out it's incorrect. If you read the information that's uh, distributed with this data set, I'm again using uh, open fMRI data. The TR is, in fact, 2. So you'll see if I hit OK, it has set the TR, hard-coded it to 1. So this is a big bummer. Uh, because the TR is actually 2 and I can't change it here. So I have to actually change it in the header. But I actually like this because in the past you both input the number of volumes and the TR. The TR I don't care, it typically doesn't change. But some studies the total number of volumes changes from run to run. And if you didn't put the right number in there, FSL did not do the correct thing. So now it just reads it automatically off the header as it should. So how do we fix this? Well, I wrote you a script. So. Uh, in the Dropbox, uh, and I'll put a, uh, a link to this in the info box of this video, you will find fixed TR in nifty header underscore bold dot py. And basically what this does, this is the rest of this is just what we've been using to loop through all the bold files. So in fact, had I known that I had to do this, when I did the other processing to my bold files, I would have inserted this into that script. So I don't want to go back and fix it now because then people who watch that video will be confused about the extra chunk of code. So I'm leaving it here. I highly recommend for you to incorporate it into the original script where we were um, processing the bold files. Anyhow, all this does, uh, actually we don't need this, so I'm going to delete that. Okay. All this does is it uses FSL info to get the header information. I'm going to show you what FSL info does. Let's put my GUI over here. All right. Okay. So if I do FSL info, this is just a shortened um, output of the header information. If you do FSL, uh, HD, yeah, this is the full header. We don't want the full header. It's too much information. So all we need is FSL info. And the stuff we want to change is right here. Actually, there's only one number we want to change. This PIXDIM4 is the TR. PIXDIM1 is the dimension of the voxel in the X direction then the Y, and then the Z, so these voxels are 5 millimeters thick. The fourth is the TR in seconds, so I need to change this to 2. 
how will I ever do that? I will tell you. It turns out that the FSL ch pixdim command, and I will just type this so you can see the help. Warning, okay, yeah, it's upset. But um, all you do is you give it the file, the xdim, ydim, zdim, and then the tdim. All we wanna change is the tdim. Now I've tried just giving it one number, thinking it would assume I was changing the tdim, and it didn't work. I can double check this, maybe I did it wrong. But uh, what my script does is it gets the current xdim, ydim, and zdim from the header, because we do not want to change those. We definitely don't want to change those. That'll screw up everything, presumably. Um, but I just want to change this number. So, go to the script. So the first thing I do is I use FSL info, and I dump that into grep for pixdim. And that creates a vector um, out. I'll show you what out looks like. So it looks like this, and then out split, I just split it, makes it into an actual vector. So then if I just pick out the third element, that's the x, the fifth is the, oops, z, wait, I can't count. The first is the x, the third is the y, fifth is the z, and then I don't care about this number because I want to change it. So that's just explaining the code very quickly. So here I'm just getting the correct pick stems that I do not want to change, and this is the one I do want to change. Again, I'm, I'm gently uh, uh, yelling at you here. Double check that that really is your TR. I checked it in the information given with my data set, and this is the correct DR, TR. So if you're using this DS008 data set, the TR is two. Uh, that information is in, well, I wonder if you guys can hear the snowplow outside, it's snowing. Um, I think it's in scan key. Yep. So scan key tells us the TR is two. By the way, the models is going to be something we're going to look at in a second since I have this directory here. So that is the TR. So if I run this script, which I haven't run it for everybody, I changed it for one run just so I could run this code for you today. This will change it for everybody. It's overwriting a file and changing the header. I can't stress to you how careful you need to be if you're changing the header of an IFTE file. So as usual, run it on a copy of a file first, quadruple check that it worked, and then um, fire away and run it and overwrite the file so you don't, um, so you don't waste space. Okay, let's go back to the GUI. So as I said, I actually fixed this for a different run. So I did it for run two. You see I have my copy in here? That's the one I tested it on. And now when I hit OK, no complaints. So it's only going to complain if it's if it thinks it's kind of a ridiculous TR. And actually a one second TR is not all that ridiculous now. But now it's two as it should be. Now it's 182. Yay. So we're ready to continue. And the next step is setting the output directory. This might seem really simple, but when I've taught this before, um, there were tons of errors in the class. Tons. So I'll explain what happened. I will emphasize this as clearly as I can. So this here is going to fill in this path here. So if you just click this, see how this filled in? Then I'm going to hit OK because I just want kind of that path, and I'm going to edit it. Actually, you know what? This isn't right. Oh, so that's... Okay. I'm going to go to the model directory. I want to put it in here, so I'm going to hit OK. So then if I go over here, it is in sub 001 model. Now, if you don't type anything, if you just leave it like this, it's going to create a directory called model.feet, which isn't what we want. We want something called run1 dot feet. Now, all you do is you type, I'm sorry, run to, this is run to. All you do is type run to. You don't want to put a slash. Um, you don't want to just do this. If you just do this, it creates a dot feet directory. If you have a file or a directory that starts with a dot, it's invisible. It's there. You can see it if you do an ls minus a, 
But if you just do an LS, you won't see it. You won't see it in the finder, which hopefully you're not using. Um, you're weaning yourself from it. So it's important that you actually type the directory that you wanted in here. You do not need to type the .feet part. It will create that for you. So again, type something, otherwise it'll be hidden. Okay, that's it. The high pass filter cutoff of 60. Well, that's interesting. I changed the defaults. Um, usually it's 100. I'm going to change it to 100. I will talk more about high pass filter cutoffs in the next <laughs> two videos. Now that I know I have to talk about that too. There'll be two videos explaining all the choices in here. So I'm changing this to 100 seconds. This has to do with chopping off low frequency noise. There was a whole video on that a while ago. Um, so I'll refer back to that. Under the pre-stats tab, uh, alternative reference image. Um, we don't need to click that. Motion correction. So this is fixing the motion within the bold data over time. That we need to do, so we want to leave this on. McFlirt is just the name of the function that does it. See how the little, the helpy bubbles are getting in my way. Uh, the unwarping, this is if you want to do field map correction. So you don't go with the defaults. Again, they, they are, they're not magic, that they know exactly what you did. So you have to have your field map and the, the field map magnitude image and these numbers. And if you hold the help bubble over here, you get a huge help bubble. I don't do this. I haven't had to do that ever. Um, my registration worked fine. So we're going to skip it. And hopefully our registrations will go well. If they don't, we will come back and fix it. Um, and I will talk about this a little bit as well. Slice timing correction. Um, here is where you would select how your slices were ordered. If it isn't one of these choices, you can upload a file. I do not slice time correct, and I will talk more about that next time, so I'm going to leave this at none. Brain extraction, we do need to run brain extraction. We've run it on our structurals, but we haven't run it on the functional data. And the five millimeter uh, smoothing is typically good. SPM has a much higher uh, smoothing kernel. I think the default is eight millimeters, but I typically go with something around twice my voxel size. As we just saw, the voxels are about <laughs> three by three. So that's about right. All right, on to the registration tab. All you need to do is put your main structural image. Now, that is up a few directories in anatomy. We've already played around with this. And I'm going to use high res underscore brain, the skull stripped one. So it's important that this is a skull stripped brain. Now, the what this is referring to is the type of registration that will be used to align the, you know what, the help bubble is driving me crazy. Get rid of that. The bold data to the subject structural. So uh, the way that's done is something called boundary-based registration. I will talk about that in the next two videos so you know what it is. It's, I've empirically tested this um, just in my class analyzing data, and this does give a much better uh, quality of registration. So I recommend BBR, and this is referring to how the subject structural is registered to the MNI brain. So this is an affine registration, 12 degrees of freedom, totally standard. Um, but you can choose nonlinear. I would leave the warp at the default. Now, when you use the nonlinear, it's important that whatever image you put in here, which ends in underscore brain, it needs the, it uses the, the brain with skull as well during this registration process, just as a reality check to keep it from going um, crazy. So it, instead of having you load that up as a separate image, it just assumes it has the same name but without the underscore brain. So if that's not the case, you're going to get an error message when you run this. So we did it that way. So I'm all set for a nonlinear registration, and I will talk about that as well. So this is called FNERT, is the nonlinear registration. Last stats, <laughs> last but certainly not least, stats. We'll set up our model. So the pre-whitening we definitely want to do. That's one of the perks of using FSL. Uh, don't add motion parameters. Yes, we want to add motion parameters. If you just use standard, this will be the six motion parameters. So the motion parameters come from, if I go back to the pre-stats tab, McFlirt. 
McFlirt is aligning the bold data time point by time point. It registers it to the middle image. And so for each time point, you get a uh, translation and rotation in the X, Y, and Z direction. So if you just do standard, it'll put in six. If you do standard plus extended, you get the six plus their um, squares and the squares, the derivatives and the derivatives. All right, voxel wise confound list. That I'm not doing here. That would be if you had a voxel by voxel confound. Um, I've actually never used that. But adding additional confound EVs, we do want to do. So this is just a text file in a one column format. And that is where we're going to put the scrubbing stuff. So if you choose to do so, so going back a video or two, when we processed our bold data, we ran this motion assessment. And in here, there's this confound.txt file. And in the confound.txt file, it's either an empty file, mine are all empty because I didn't have any scrubbing, or it has a column for each bad TR, and that column's all zeros except for a one for the TR that's getting scrubbed. To keep scripting consistent, I've created empty files so that I could just have something to put in for everybody. So that subject, that run, I'm sure they didn't have anything scrubbed, but um, that's okay. I, I'm just dumping in an empty file. It doesn't hurt the model to put something empty in there. Now we're ready for the full model setup. If you go to in the this condition key dot text, so that's in the model directory, in the main in the main directory. If you go into the model directory, you'll find this, and this explains the onset files and what they correspond to. So task O one condition one is go, and then we have successful stop, failed stop, and junk, and then this corresponds to the second task. So I will need four EVs, which stands for explanatory variable. All right, so I'm going to change this to four. The first one is go. Let's use lowercase. Now we don't want square. We're going to use the custom three column format. Again, the first column is the onset time in seconds. The second column is the duration of the stimulus. And the third is the parametric modulation. If you don't have modulation, you just set that to one. So custom three column format, 90% of the time, this is what you'll use. Then you insert the file name. And make sure I'm in the right directory. I am not. I'm in run one. Oops. Wait. Here we go. Task 01, run two. Condition one. Now, okay. So, so far, I put in the name, I changed this to three column format, and I put in the onset file name. Condition 001 which is go. You want to change this to a double gamma HRF. Uh, it has the post stimulus undershoot. I talked about this long, long ago in the summer cram session. The gamma tends to overestimate activation. You might be thinking that sounds awesome, but use the double gamma and be honest. You want your model to fit your data well. The temporal derivative, talked about this before as well. The temporal derivative can soak up variability if your onset timing is off or the peak assumption of the time to peak in the double gamma HRF is off by a little bit. This can help out with that. Temporal filtering, you will always leave this on. So let me explain this. A high pass filter, I talked about this before, previous video, um, is used to remove low frequency noise. So there are three places where this high pass filter pops up. Under the data tab, we set the cutoff. I change it to 100 seconds. I'm going to check why that changed. The default used to be 100. So I set it at 100 seconds. Um, and then you'll notice under the pre-stats tab, it says temporal filtering high pass. This is referring to the data. It's important that whatever you do to the data, you do it to the de design as well. So this is a little bit of an unfortunate design, or maybe there's a reason for it, because I wish turning it on here automatically turned it on here but it doesn't. Actually, I take that back. I can think of times where I might not temporarily filter something, possibly. So anyway, this high pass filters the data. This high pass filters the design. Most of the time, you want to do both, so you need this to be checked. So as it was, that was the default. Okay, 
So quick recap, put the name, custom three column format, put the file in, change to double gamma, and left everything else as it was. Don't orthogonalize, wrote a whole paper on that. Okay, I'm just gonna quickly set up the rest of these. And next one is successful stop. So we'll call this suck stop. Change it to three column format, put the file name, uh, make sure that was the right run. Nope, run two. Double gamma, everything else stays. Next is failed stop, fail stop. Three column format, let's do this right. Double gamma. Looks good. Last is junk. Wait, is it junk? Yep. Junk is just trials where things didn't go right. We don't want to not model them because then they go into the baseline. And I wish this would reset itself, but whatever. Double gamma. Last but not least, you set your contrast. I have a whole video on setting contrast. I'm just going to do um, the ones versus baseline. So I'll have go, stop, was it stop successful is the second one? Yep. And fail, stop, and then I'll do uh, successful stop versus go. I don't even know, I'm not a psychologist. If that doesn't make sense, leave me alone. So for that, successful stop minus go, go gets a minus one, successful stop gets a plus one. Okie doke. So then I can click done. It shows me does a design matrix. So you can see the contrast down here so you can double check that you did them right. And you'll notice each EV explanatory variable has two columns. This is the actual regressor. This is its derivative, which again can pick up variability if your um, time to peak is off by a little bit or your onset time's off by a little bit. And you can see we had one junk trial in this run. It's okay if there's nothing here. You will get an error message that seems to say that you have a um, rank deficiency, but it's okay. Talk about that more later. Ugh, and empty EVs. I'll have to talk about empty EVs too. That'll come with the level two analysis. So this all looks good. Um, so I'm going to click that. Last but not least, post stats. We're running a level one analysis. I don't want to look at thresholded maps. So it's a waste of space. So I'm going to put none and always turn off the create time series plots. It wastes so much space. We ran out of space once in, on our server and somebody went through and deleted just the TS plots directories and it freed up a ton of space. So that was cool. Then you can just click go. <laughs> Hope this works. And it will automatically, since I didn't turn it off, fire up my browser and it'll tell me how it's going and this is the log and we'll review all of that next time. And it will stay still running until it finishes. Whew. This one ran long, but I can't really help it. So notes, check your TR. If it's not correct in the header, use the fixed TR in niftybold.py uh, script linked in the description box below to fix it. Be careful when specifying your output path. If you ran an analysis and you don't have anything there, do an ls minus a in the directory to see if you accidentally created a hidden directory. And slice timing correction, this is your decision. I choose not to do it and I will cover this next time. Registration, I don't want this to be a black box. I will spend some time going over image registration because I haven't done any videos on it yet. Um, stats, you can skip the confound.txt if you don't want to scrub. I am choosing to do it. And uh, adding motion parameters, I use all 24. If you just want six, choose six. And don't forget to change to the double gamma HRF. Post stats, why bother with it within run thresholding? It creates thresholded maps. It will create Z-stat maps anyway, so if you really want to look at them, you can just do uncorrected thresholding. This not only saves space, it saves time. It will run a lot faster. So, and don't forget to turn off the TS plots.
That's it. Try one on your own. If you mess up, who cares, right? It's just practice. Don't run a bunch because the GUI is a dumb way to analyze a whole data set. It's a waste of your time. So we will learn to script this soon. It might be a couple of videos because I need to cover the behind the scenes stuff, but we'll get there. So thanks a lot. Please join the Facebook group or follow on Tumblr or Twitter or all three. Thanks for hanging in there and have a great day.